Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? So good to see you guys in the room. Thanks to those of you joining us online. We're so glad that you are here. I hope that all of you had a very Merry Christmas, a time of peace and a time of experiencing the wonderful gift that God gave us through his son, Jesus Christ. Hopefully you got some family time if you have family, uh, whether that was online or in person, but we're just glad you're here. How many of you made, out, made it out to the candlelight service Christmas Eve? Yeah, that was awesome. What a beautiful picture of everyone being together. We were socially distanced out there, but it was awesome. And uh, look forward to more times like that with you as a church family. I want to remind you of a few things that we have coming up um, as we get going this morning in worship. One of those is that we have a wonderful opportunity to seek God together in the new year. Starting January the 20th, we are going to have 21 days of fasting and prayer as a church. If you're desiring more of God in your life, maybe you need a breakthrough of some kind. Maybe you just need to walk more closely with God. 21 days of fasting and prayer will start on January the 10th and run through January the 31st. You might be new to fasting and you'll find out more through the guide that Pastor Jerry has put together for us. And uh, if you haven't ever fasted before, it is fantastic. It is a way to deny your flesh and allow your spirit to really connect with God. But we're going to fast and pray together as a church. We're going to experience breakthroughs individually. I know some of us are ready to break through 2020. Can I get a round of applause for that? And uh, But hey, there are great things happening in 2020. But 2021, I'm just confessing today in the name of Jesus, it's going to be a fantastic year. And we're going to start it off right spiritually as a family. You'll be able to get that guide online on the website. You'll find it on the app. But uh, be looking for that. And also, you probably received an email if you're part of the church family from Pastor Jerry where you can find uh, more about that God. So that's one thing that's coming up. Another thing coming up is we're praying in the new year together. Uh, this morning, Jane Gehring or someone will be out in the lobby. Uh, if you would like to help us pray in the new year, we do that every year. You sign up for an hour. There's a God that you get on what to pray for. But we just commit to praying in the new year together because that's the best way to start the new year, isn't it? With the Lord talking with him. So I encourage you to sign up for that. If you want more information about that from an online experience, you can look on the website. You can also mail me, Robert, at thefellowship.org, and I'll make sure that I get you in touch with Jane to sign up for an hour to pray. Hope you'll take advantage of that. It's a great thing to do together for unity as a church. And then lastly... We have been growing in our numbers throughout each Sunday, and we are going to two services again back in January. I'm excited about that because we're ramping back up to how things kind of used to be. Things will be better. Things will be different. But two services in 2021, starting January the 10th, the, the day we start fasting and prayer, those service times... Um, Pay really close attention to this. We're moving from 9.15. We're going to start the first service a little earlier at 9 a.m. Now, why? Because you're so dedicated to Jesus that you want to get up early. We know we have kept you longing uh, for not getting here earlier, and you've been wanting that, so we're going to 9.15. It also allows us to get ready between services to make sure we sanitize things and so forth. 10.45, by the way, at 9 o'clock, it'll be a restaurant style. That's the way we describe it, just like it is now, where we encourage you to wear your mask as you're interacting in the lobby. Um, but once you get in the worship service, you are welcome to take that off. The 1045 service will be mask required for the adults uh, in service and outside. We just have people on both ends of the spectrum that we want to accommodate and love well. And so you can choose your service and uh, you can find out more information about that in the weeks to come. All right. With all of those announcements out of the way, here's the most important one. We have an opportunity this morning to do something Christians long to do, and that is to worship the King. And so I hope that you are ready, that you are excited, because Jerry has a fantastic message ready for you. The worship band, I heard them rehearsing. It's going to be fantastic. So are you ready? Are you ready at home? If you are, uh, if you're in the room, could I encourage you to stand at home? You're welcome to stand or sit right where you are, but let's get our hearts ready to worship because God is doing great things. Well, amen. He is doing great things. Let's worship together. Let's celebrate. He is the hero of heaven and he's with us here today. Bow at his feet, he has done great things. 
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. Sing that with us. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We every voice lift it high. This is what
Amen. The labor of love. Jesus Christ came into the world, Emmanuel, God with us. And when he died on the cross, the curtain veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying that we all could enter into the Holy of Holies, the place of God, and meet with him and talk with him, commune with him, to experience his love and his power and his grace and all that he has for his children. Praise be to Jesus Christ who reconciles us to God. You can have a seat this morning. We're going to enter into a time of prayer. We're a church built on the foundation of prayer. And prayer, as Oswald Chambers said, is the exercise of drawing on God's grace. All of us need an extra measure of God's grace. Wouldn't you agree this morning? A, a clap would tell me that you agree that you need an extra measure of God's grace for 2020 and 2021. <laughs> If you're online, I believe that for you as well this morning, that we could all use an extra measure of God's grace. I want to give you just a moment to turn in any prayer request or praise that you have so that our prayer team can pray for that request or celebrate that praise with you. And the way you do that this morning is you can click on the prayer request button on the app. If you're watching online, you can do that through the app or click on prayer on the web there. I'm going to give you about 40 seconds to do that, and we'll come back together and pray for your request. We're going to pray for two churches this morning, Woven Covenant Church with Pastor Wayne Park and Zion Hill Baptist Church with Pastor David McDonald. So let's take just a moment and make those requests known to the Lord. to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, first of all, we say thank you for another opportunity to draw close to you, to experience your goodness and your mercy and your love and your grace this morning. Father, we lift up our church to you. We lift up each person here and those watching online, and we ask, Father, for an extra measure of your grace today. We thank you for all the grace that you've shown us all the ways that you work in our lives, the sovereignty at which, Lord, you work all things together for good to those of us who are called and love you. So, Father, we just trust today that you will meet all of our needs according to your wonderful, perfect will and your glorious riches in heaven. Father, we pray for churches all around the world who are worshiping you today, that you would fill them with your spirit. They would experience a deep closeness with you and Lord, we especially pray this morning for Woven Covenant Church, Pastor Wayne, and Zion Hill Baptist Church with Pastor David. Father, move in our midst, move in theirs. We love you and thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of my favorite preachers and evangelists of all time is the great Billy Graham, who's gone to be with the Lord. And if there was ever a man I wanted to meet on earth while we were still here, one of those would definitely be Billy Graham. He was, a, he was just a guy who walked with God. And Billy Graham said this when it comes to giving. He said, God gave us two hands for a reason. He gave us one hand to receive from him, but he gave another hand for us to give. And I love that image. One to receive, but we receive in order that we give have an opportunity to give back to the Lord for 2020 this morning to remind yourself that you are dependent on God's grace. And it's also just to let God know that you trust him. Last week, we had our biggest giving week of the entire year. And I just want to celebrate that. I, I've been trusting God that even though we're behind on tithing due to people losing jobs and COVID and, and let's face it, people get scared. People get afraid to trust God. But not our church. I, I claim that today in Jesus' name, not our church. We're going to trust God. 
And so I believe that as we end 2020, we can go out and have a huge Sunday or end of the year. And I'll help you out. If you're worried about your taxes, give more because it'll help you on your taxes too. <laughs> I really I really want us to trust God. And I, I trust that you'll do that today. If you'd like to give this morning, you can text give to the number that you see on the screen. You can also click give on the app at the bottom of the screen or give on the web. But this is an opportunity for you to take what God has given you and to give back to him a little bit of that saying, God, I trust that where that came from, there's so much more. So I hope you'll do that. That allows us to live into the vision that God has given us to love each other well. We have done that as a church this holiday season. We have blessed some families who really were in need in our community and beyond. And I hope we'll continue that as a church. So I hope you'll give this morning trusting God. We are in our last week of this series called God With Us. And we've talked about God being with us in the valley. God being with us in the desert and God being with us in the storms. And God is going to be with us in a new way as Jerry will bring the message this morning and let us know. And so I hope that you'll prepare your heart. If you're watching online or you're here in the room, be sure to open your app, follow along on the notes as we hear a word from the Lord's from the Lord this morning. Good morning. I want to welcome those that are joining us online and those that are here in person as we wrap up this series of messages called God with us, Emmanuel. This morning, I want us to think about a very complex and theological word. And, you know, normally I might not throw this word out there, but it's one that we want to unpackage and unwrap this morning. It's the word incarnation. You know, have you ever had a stain on some clothes that you couldn't get out? Maybe it was a favorite shirt or favorite pair of pants, and, uh, you know, you got a grease spot or you spilled something on you, and you just couldn't get that stain out. In our house, we have several different things that we use to get stains out. Usually, if it's grease, I begin with Goo Gone, 
And if you ever use Goo Gone, you know, you put a little bit on it and it kind of gets that, you know, and then, then I wash it and then I dry it. Ah, the stain is still there. And then, and then we use Barkeeper's Friend. And so Barkeeper's Friend is kind of like what you clean your stainless with and I'll get some and create a paste. These are things my wife has taught me, by the way. And, and then I get a little paste and I put it on there and I let it sit. It's supposed to soak, you know, the stuff that's not supposed to be there, soak it up and and, and then I put it in the wash and wash it again and take it out and dry it. Because you don't put it in the dryer. So my wife tells me because dryer set stains in. And so I've learned to, you know, put, hang it up and, and let it dry. And ah, the stain is still there. And so I use shout and I scrub it and do the pre-wash. And, and then I even throw some extra soap in and, you know, do everything I can. And I wash it and I get it out and I'm praying and hoping and I dry it and... The stain is still there. Have you ever had, you ever done like that? And, and it's, it's one of your favorite shirts. And I'm also really bad, like white stuff. I'm a, I'm a guy, and early on in our marriage, I just threw everything in the wash at one time. You know, the brightest reds with the whitest whites, and things come out pink. And, and Gail and I had a lot of conversations about my, my lack of you know, clothes washing ability. And, and over time, though, she taught me really well. And, and I, I have lapses in judgment every once in a while. I throw in a dish towel with whites, and she catches it in the dryer and scolds me. And I get in trouble and say, okay, look, I'm gonna, I'm, you're not going to be able to wash clothes anymore if you don't get this right. I know what some of you guys are thinking. Jerry, this is your chance to get out. It's great. You know, you can say, you're right. I can't get this right. You don't ever have to wash clothes again. But that's actually my job in the family is I actually get to wash clothes. But I bought Gail recently a new washer and dryer, and so now she actually likes washing it. That was the plan. And so she actually <laughs> likes washing clothes even more than I do, and she's better at not causing things to get stained and, and things like that. And so, but, but I've had clothes that I just get stained or she gets stained, and we can't get the stain out. And what do you do when you've got something you, you really like well, nowadays, you, th you have to throw it away and, you know, buy something else. But, you know, there was a day. Can you imagine if it's all the clothes you had? And whether it was stained or not, it's all you had to wear. And so you just wore that with all of its stains. And, you know, there was a day where clothes were very different than what we think of today. As a matter of fact, colors didn't even exist in the way that we think of colors today. Uh, it was a very brown and gray and black world. And colors were just very drab. And, and even when they added colors, it was only splashes or threads of colors. You, you might get some different colors. And, and, you know, that's why when you read of like Joseph and his coat of many colors, it's, it's like this was a unbelievable thing because usually color when it did exist it was for royalty and it was for the really wealthy the average person you know didn't have color in their clothes during the time of Jesus you know you just you, you think about even washing stuff I mean they didn't have a lot of kind of detergents like we have today they take their clothes down and they wash it and you get it dirty what was white kind of looks muddy you know kind of like when you go swimming in the down in Galveston, it's like if you got a white bathing suit and you go swimming down in Galveston, it doesn't stay white, you know? It's just, there's something about the water and, you know, the mud of the Mississippi coming and, you know, well, you've been there, so, and it's just really bad and it's, nothing stays white. Well, it's the same way. I mean, whites don't stay whites and browns kind of get even more dingy and just color, and you wear those things. This color was different and clothes were different. They always looked a little dull and a little dirty, you know, the world didn't have a lot of white in it. Think about that. There, there wasn't a lot of white. And so when, when Isaiah comes along and says something like, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. I mean, this idea of something being white in a world of dingy, of dirty, of gray, uh, of blacks, of, of stuff that rarely ever was white. I mean, that's why white is attributed to God as something that's pure and holy. And because it's not attributed to us, culture didn't see it and didn't understand it. But this, this white, I mean, when sin entered the world, it became a stain 
upon humanity. It was a stain that we couldn't get off of our lives. Every sin becomes a stain. The sin of lust, greed, anger, judgmentalism, arrogance, pride, envy, jealousy, hate, laziness, gluttony, apathy, indifference. The sins go on. Our lives have sin. Every single person in this room and watching online, we are born with sin. A sin nature, a predisposition that eventually all of us sin. And the Bible says the wages, the price, the result of sin is death. It's death that is eternal. It's a death against the soul. You and I would die and spend an eternity away from God, our creator, our Lord. The grave becomes the final judgment. And so that, that's the world that Jesus was born into. That's the world in which humanity is lives in. It is a world that is stained, and it is a stain upon humanity that can never be removed. No matter how hard you try, no matter how good you try to be, no matter how generous, no matter how loving, no matter how much you go to church, no matter how much you give, no matter what you do to try to take the stain away, it is permanently, permanently there upon humanity. This is the world that Jesus came into. This is, this is the world that the prophets wrote about because they, they said, but there is one who is white as snow, one whose purity, one whose robes and righteousness are, are pure and he alone, a Messiah, a Savior that comes into the world. Someday when you meet him, someday when you believe in him, you can take on his righteousness, his whiteness, his rightness with God. What an amazing thought and idea. You know, this idea that when it says in Isaiah 118, though your sins are as scarlet. I began thinking about it. So, so how did the children of Israel get scarlet? Well, it's actually, it's called the crimson worm. There, there's a worm in the oak trees in the Mediterranean that it doesn't fly. It's a, like a little worm. And when it begins to have babies, it actually expands its body and it attaches to a limb. And it's like a big crimson pea. And inside this big crimson pea are all these little eggs. And when they hatch, they feed on the mom's body. And what the children of Israel would do and what people would do in that time is they would go on these oak trees and they would scrape off these little peas and then they would crush them and dry them out and create a powder. And it was that powder that they used to create a stain, a, a scarlet stain. And it was that scarlet stain that was even used in the temple, uh, the tabernacle that Moses was instructed to build in the wilderness. They, they put this stain on the tent walls. Even the priests in their ephods, their sacred garments that they would wear, they put this this stain that came from this bug, this crimson worm. It's got some long name that I can't even say, but, but it's, it's this worm. It's this little thing. They would see colors in nature and take those colors and create pastes and dyes, but they weren't, they weren't the kind of things that we see where we saturate a garment, you know, where our whole garment is crimson. It was, it was painted on or, or maybe, you know, soaked in as best they could to get a color and this was a color, a crimson color that did not fade. I mean, it stayed with you. It was a real stain. So when Isaiah says, though your sins be as scarlet, though this sin, this sin that's just can't get rid of, it doesn't come out. It is a stain. Your sins will be forgiven. You could become as white as white can be. Just beautiful and sinless. This is... This is something that had to happen. A stain removed, a sin forgiven, purity restored, relationship restored. That's what God desires more than anything else for all of humanity. That this is the reason for the incarnation. That this is the reason that God came in the flesh. That, that's the definition. That's the definition you and I know. God became flesh in the person of his son, 
Jesus. <clears throat> and at the heart of Christianity, the gospel is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And apart from him being born and becoming flesh and living this sinless life and standing in the gap for us and giving his life on the cross and shedding his blood and going to the grave and then resurrecting and being victorious over the grave and death, apart from his birth, none of that would happen. None of that would happen. The incarnation begins the story of God's redemption. That a virgin would be, conceive a child and he would be born, and they would call his name Emmanuel. You see, at the heart of this story is hope. Apart from the coming of the eternal Son, there is no hope. Now, God could have shouted, and he did. He, he told through the prophets. They proclaimed the coming of a Messiah. They, they proclaimed a Savior. They proclaimed one who would come. But God did more than shout. He showed his love. You see, God didn't shout his love from heaven. He showed his love by coming to earth. I mean, you can shout or you can show. There's a big difference between shouting and showing. I mean, when I was, you know, with a young dad with my kids and they were all growing up, I did my fair share of shouting. You know, I remember one day I asked my kids, how can I be a better dad? They said, dad, don't yell so much. I said, I don't yell, I'm a loud talker. <laughs> they laughed and they, they said, no dad, you, you yell, you shout, you know. And so I had to work on, on that, you know, not shouting, not yelling. And, and your truth is, we can even shout our love and say, I love you, but it means so much more when words are followed by actions, when you actually show and demonstrate your love for someone. I mean, it's just a big difference between shouting something and showing something. You see, this, this idea of incarnation, you know, even when we try to describe it, th there's a... There's a lot of things about this idea of incarnation. Uh, even in the early church, as they would talk about it, it was more about what was not true about what was true. I found this little three-minute video that kind of is a cartoon and a character of a writing that describes the complexities of the incarnation. So let's watch it now. They say that good fences make good neighbors. What this means, I think, is that having clear boundaries is a vital part of healthy relationships. This is certainly true in psychology. Many therapists will talk about how important it is for emotional well-being to be clear on what is me and what is not me, and how unhealthy relationships can become when we don't respect each other's boundaries. Whether or not good fences make good neighbors, they do make for good theology. At least, it's important to have theological boundary markers when we try to speak about the deep truths of the Christian faith. Take, for instance, the Incarnation. That is, what Christians believe happened when God came to us in the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Traditionally, Christians have held to four key beliefs about Jesus. That he was fully God, that he was fully human, and that these two natures, human and divine, were united together in one single person. This can be hard to explain. What do we actually mean when we say that Jesus was both God and human, two natures, in one person? In a way, it's easier to say what we don't mean by it than to say what we do. And this is where good fences come in handy. Because over the last 2,000 years, a variety of heresies have cropped up regarding the nature of the Incarnation. The word heresy, of course, tends to conjure up unsettling images from the Spanish Inquisition or something. But a heresy is really just a teaching about Jesus that the Church has carefully examined and decided it doesn't express their beliefs truly. Think about it like a fence that helps us mark off what we don't mean when we talk about the mysteries of God. There was a group of teachers, for instance, called the Ebionites. They taught that Jesus was not God at all. Rather, he was a great man who had attained special status with God. Essentially, the church looked at Ebionism and said, no, that's not what we experienced in Jesus. To say that he was not God goes past one of the boundaries. In a similar way, some claim that Jesus was not human, that he was God, but only appeared to be human. This heresy is sometimes called docetism, after a Greek word that means to seem or to appear. And the church looked at docetism and said, 
No, that's not it either. To say that Jesus was only God goes past another boundary. Later, a teacher named Arius would suggest that Jesus was not fully God, that he was divine, but a lesser, secondary God. And again, the church said, no, that's not it. And so another boundary marker was placed. Jesus is fully God. A teacher named Apollinarius taught that Jesus was not fully human, that he had the body of a human, but the mind of God. And again, the church said, no, Jesus is fully human. Some taught that Jesus was not one person, but two, the divine Jesus and the human Jesus. Some taught that Jesus' nature was neither human nor divine, but some brand new sort of nature that had never existed before, or that he started out as a man and became divine. And Christians looked at each of these teachings in turn and said, no, that's not it. In this way, they set out the boundary markers for what they didn't mean when they said that in Jesus, God had come in human flesh. Jesus was not part God, part human, or a human that only seemed like God, or a God who only appeared human. He was fully human and fully God, two natures together in one person. While this may seem like so much theological hair splitting to some, maintaining these boundaries is vital to a full and growing experience of the Lord Jesus. After all, just like good fences help neighbors to thrive, good theological fences help our relationship with God to thrive. So you can see there's a lot of complexity with just this one idea, the incarnation. Because throughout history, as people have tried to explain that God would become fully human and yet fully divine, and yet he would live a sinless life, and yet he was tempted as we are tempted. I mean, when we think about this truth, it can become very complex. Jesus, born into the world, God with us. You know, we've read this verse over this passage over the last several uh, weeks from Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a, ma a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew was quoting Isaiah 7, 14. Again, the prophet who says, Therefore, the prophet Isaiah, therefore the Lord will give us a sign. And behold, the, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Now, part of the problem, you know, is we think about what, what is it with this name? I mean, there's so much about the names of Jesus that speak of who he is and what he's done for us and does with us and does to us. And it's, it's an amazing thing. And what he gives us, even when we look in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. I mean, his name has changed us. It's changed the world. It changes the story, our story that once was that we were stained by sin, that we were long, we longed for, for the grave. That's, that's where we were headed to death. And yet there was one who would come to redeem and to restore and give us life to the fullest, eternal life, restore our relationship with the Father. On his deathbed, John Wesley, John Wesley is the father of the Methodist movement, often called the father of Methodism. It's said that when John Wesley was on his deathbed, he simply said this, the best of all is God is with us. 
that, that the best of everything that we can think of is this incarnation that God, that God would make a way that the the Jesus, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that the Son would come, be born, that he would take on this human form and that he would become like us. He would become a human being and that he would live the perfect and sinless life and become the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You see, God with us is the best news of every day not just on one's final day, isn't it? It's the best news every day. And, and maybe that's the news we're going to take into 2021. That as we wrap up 2020, there is this single profound truth that can change every single waking moment of your life. God is with us. I mean, that is, that is a radical thought. This incarnation. God is with us. The simple statement. I want to break out this simple statement into three other statements, okay? So we're just going to look at these three words just real quickly. And then I want to leave you with three things to apply to your life out of this statement. So here's the first statement. Jesus is God with us. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Only God can remove the sin from our lives, the stain, the penalty of sin. It says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life. I mean, only God can do that. Jesus received, you know, when you look at even Jesus acknowledging that he was God. You know, whenever you see an angel in the Bible, often people will, you know, who experience the angels will immediately bow. What do the angels say? The angels say, get up. Don't, don't bow down to me. I'm an angel. I'm a created being just like you. When anyone bowed to Jesus, he never said, get up. Don't bow to me. I'm just a man. You see, the very response to how Jesus responded to others is, again, an attribute to even what he thought of himself, that he was the Messiah, that he was God incarnate, that he was the one who could take away the sin of the world. He knew his mission. He knew his purpose. He was God. And those around him worshiped him as such. Now, here's the interesting thing. And, and to me, this is one of the strongest points of, of the early church on how we know that God, that Jesus is God. And that is that among the Jews, they were the people who were least likely to follow Jesus because they believed that God could never be a human being. As a matter of fact, if you look in the book of Numbers in the 23rd chapter, 19th verse, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a man that he should repent. And they read that and believed that what God was saying is God could never be a human being. And so they, they were appalled to think that the early church would go, no, Jesus is God. And that a human being named Jesus would not just see himself as a Messiah, but the Messiah, the one who would save them from their sins, and that he believed and said that he was God. That's why it was so, so just appalling to the Pharisees and to the religious leaders that this man would believe that he was God. And yet, those Jews that were with him and saw him and heard him, they believed. They believed this thing that was so just counterintuitive to everything they had been taught. And yet their eyes, they could did not deny what they experienced and what they saw, even to the point that after the resurrection, they went to their graves professing the truth of Jesus Christ, that he was indeed God. I mean, it's an unbelievable thing when you think about that. Well, Jesus is God, and Jesus is the way. 
You know, this is kind of one of those things that really bugs people and irritates people a lot when we talk about the irritating exclusivity of the gospel. When we say that Jesus is the only way. I mean, in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word, or the word was with God and the word was God and he was in the beginning. Skip down to the 14th verse, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus goes on in John 14, 6, and he says, hey, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And, and you know, I, I hear people and have heard people through the years say, isn't that arrogant? You know, this exclusivity of the Christian faith, you know, the Christians are so arrogant to think that Jesus is the only way. Why aren't there many ways to God? I mean, after all, if God loves all of us, why would he just create one way? Why doesn't he let there be many ways? Isn't that kind of arrogant? You know, I, I want to say, or narrow-minded even, isn't that narrow-minded to think that, you know, there's only one way? Well, it'd be like a doctor. Can you imagine a doctor giving you a diagnosis? And you, you got the diagnosis, and you, you took the medicine, and you didn't get any better. Would you be narrow-minded if you got a second opinion? Would you be narrow-minded if you didn't trust that possibly there could be something else going on? And maybe you get another doctor, and the doctor says, here's the answer. And he gives you the cure, and you get well. Is that being narrow-minded? Is that being arrogant because you chose not to believe this and to believe this, that this doctor said, this is the problem and this is the cure. Just the opposite. I mean, God so loves us that he doesn't want us to go in ways that don't lead to forgiveness and redemption and restoration. I mean, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, to a woman. There's a way that we choose because it looks easy or it's more fun or it, it fits our personality. And so we choose this way. And he says, there's a way that seems right to you, but you know what? In the end, it leads to death. And so do you want God to say, hey, if you like that way, it's okay, go ahead. Would you rather he say, hey, listen, that way isn't gonna take your sin away. That way isn't gonna heal the brokenness in your heart. That, that way is not gonna fill that void. That way is, is gonna cause more pain and more misery. And in the end, you're gonna die. You know, there was this uh, ma magician in uh, Las Vegas and uh, He's an atheist, and he was asked one time about Christians because they had, one had given him a Bible. And he, and, he, and he said this. He said, I expect Christians to tell me about Jesus. I mean, if they really believe it, because to not tell me about Jesus is the most unloving thing they could ever do to me. I mean, sometimes we're so afraid that we're going to offend someone by saying to them, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have life everlasting. <gasps> How dare you say that? How dare you make it that this is the only way? That you should create this exclusivity and this arrogance and this narrow-mindedness you see, there's a world that's angry and doesn't want to know the truth. And yet when they die and they get to the end, they will be begging for someone. It's just like Lazarus who was dead and in, you know, in paradise. And he's looking up and he's saying, please, please go tell my family. Please, will somebody go tell them? You see, the incarnation it, it is the beginning birth of this gospel that changes everything. Jesus is God. He is God. If Christmas is right, then everything makes sense to us. The problem is sin, and the answer is a Savior. And who is the Savior? His name is Jesus, and he is God in the flesh, God with us. He is also God with us. He's not just God, he's God with us. He comes alongside us. He is here right now. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
In John 14, he says this, and if you keep my commandments, then you love me and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And even if the spirit, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him, it does not know him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he will be with you and I will never leave you. I'll not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I mean, this is what Jesus said. He enters into the world and he says, I will always be with you. I'll never leave you. Hebrews 13, five through six. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I mean, he is with us. So this next year, as you go through physical problems, as you go through financial problems, as you go through emotional problems, as you go through relational problems, as you go through mental problems, as you go through all kinds of problems in the world. As we get older and we go through this, you are not alone. You are not alone. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if the incarnation has changed your life because Jesus came and lived this perfect and sinless life and died on a cross for you and he gave his life for you and you believe that and you believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection, you say, God, you loved me and you did that for me so that you could be with me forever. And if you believe that, you are not alone. Okay, whether you are single, whether you are widowed, whether, and, and I tell you this year, like ever before, there are people watching who I know at home have been isolated. We've been isolated and yet we have never been alone. And don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let the enemy tell you that you are alone. You are not. Now we need each other. We need each other. We need, we need the community. And the, Jesus, his body is the church. And those who know him are the church. And that's the body of Christ. And we need each other. Christianity is not meant to be lived in isolation. But here's the thing. No matter where you are, you are never alone. Never. I mean, what an incredible truth for you and I just to grasp and get a hold of. He is with us. He is with us. Jesus took away a sin. He took away every fear, every barrier. Jesus is God with us. Notice it doesn't say Jesus is God with everyone. Now, God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. No doubt about it. But it doesn't say God is with everyone. There is exclusivity. It says God is with us. Who is the us? The us. The us are the outcasts, the humble. The us are those that we recognize that we have nothing to offer. The us are those who recognize that we are sinful and separated from God. And that apart from God, the stain will always be there. Who are the us? The us are people who come, who come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I need you. I can't be good enough, can't go to church enough, can't give enough money. God, I just recognize I'm trying to be a good person, but you know what? I've got this stain and this stain. There is nothing I can do to remove this stain from my life. And even though Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, only through Jesus can they be as white as snow. Only then can you and I be restored to a right relationship, not because of anything we have done, but because of what he's done. He is with us. Who are the us? Those who come to the foot of the cross, who kneel before him and say, Lord Jesus, I can't do this without you. I can't do this. What does it profit a man if he gained the world and lose his soul? You know, there are a lot of smart, beautiful, wealthy, happy people in the world who will spend an eternity in hell. And that breaks my heart. 
Because we've told the world, if you're beautiful and you're wealthy and you're smart and you're happy, that's all that matters. Let me tell you, that's a lie. That is a lie straight out of hell. And yet we look around the world, and I'll be honest, we go, oh, they are, man, we look at all the beautiful people, all the smart people. We look at all the wealthy people. We look at all the happy people. And then we look at our lives, and sometimes we, we think, man, I'm getting older and fatter and grayer, and I lost my job, and, you know, I do stupid stuff, and, you know, I'm unhappy at times, and I just think, man, what's wrong with me, God? You see, that's because... We don't see ourselves the way God sees us. God looks down and he sees us. And he says, I loved you so much that I came to the earth and gave my life for you. You are worth more than anything the world says. Anything. And so who are the us? The us are the people who humble themselves before the Lord and acknowledge our great need before God. And that takes a lot because you know what? We, we, we teach our children that, you know, they're good and, and pull up your boots, you know, by your bootstraps and you can do it. You can be anything you want to be. And, and we, we just, you know, fan the little ego in them and we just want them to go out and succeed and all the time. And then we turn around and say, yeah, but you're a sinner and there's a stain in your life. And that, that struggle that, wait a second, and, and only the Holy Spirit comes, and maybe some of you this morning, the Holy Spirit's convicting you, and you feel the conviction, and you go, you know what Jerry's saying is true. It's true. And God wants to be with you. He wants you included in the us. That's what he wants more than anything else. What if you could finish 2020 and know that going into 2021, that God is with you? But I'm just saying, don't, don't go into next year without the full knowledge that you have been forgiven of your sin and that the incarnation, the very coming of God into the world and his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection has made a difference in your life because you have humbly come to him and acknowledged your own sin and your own desperate need for him. You know, the truth is that going into 2021, that God is with us. So the question is, how will that impact your life? How will that impact your life? Gail and I, the other day, were talking about how 2021 is going to be different. First of all, with what we eat how much we exercise. Are those the first two on everybody's list you know, at the beginning of the year? I think it, it's kind of like, did they just put, just put those at the top because those are also the first ones that we fail at. So we just kind of put them at the top, kind of move on. Um, but you know, what, what's, what's gonna be the impact of this truth that God is with us in 2021? Let me just give you three things to think about. Here's the first one. If God is with us, then we need to take off our limits. Now, here's the thing, and I believe this. There is not a bad habit in your life too big for God to take. Do you believe that? I know some of you are like, you know, Jerry, I can't. I don't have enough time to pray. I don't know how to pray. I'm terrible at Bible study. God, you know, I, I'm in, you know, I just... I'm too busy, you know, I've got this bad habit of, of lust or anger or I've got this addiction or I've, I'm a workaholic or, you know, I've got this stuff. And maybe the truth is, listen, you year after year after year after year, you put it up there on the, on the list and you fail at it. Let me tell you something. The fact that God is with you says that you can, through Christ and through his presence in your life, overcome sin. I want you to hear that. Now, God is not looking for perfection, but he is looking for progress. All right? There's no one going to be perfect, but let's make some progress, people. 
I mean, let's, let's say, okay, I, I, I wasn't doing well last year, but man, I'm going to move the needle. There is nothing in your life. Take off your limits. Quit telling yourself that you can't overcome, that you can't grow, that you can't learn, that you can't get better. I mean, God is faithful, we are told, to do the good work he's begun in us. And he's faithful. He wants to do something in you that you know he longs to do. He wants to do that. So take off the limits. Quit telling yourself what God can't do. You go, into, go into 2021 thinking, this is what I want. God, I want to experience you more powerfully. God, I want a time every day where I spend time with you. God, I want to actually know you more intimately and more personally. I do. Take off the limits. Here's the second thing. Look at what he did. Look what he did to be with you. So what are you doing to be with him? I've had to think a lot about this in my own life. God left heaven. We're told in the book of Philippians that simply this, that having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It is a habit. It could be a lack of discipline. You could be saying you're too busy, but listen to me. Think about what it costs Jesus to be with you, and it is nothing in comparison to what it might cost you to be with him. What will it cost you? What will you do this year? What, what are you doing to be with him? He's with you. Now, I liken this the difference between going to a concert and experiencing it, right? And then there's backstage passes. And there's getting to meet the person. And then they give you their, their phone number. And they say, call me anytime. And then they send you an email. And they say, hey, you and your family want to come over to, my, to our house up in Colorado and have, have Thanksgiving with us? See, most of us, most of us think we go to a concert and we go, I know them. I'm just the biggest fan. Oh, I love them. You've got a Facebook page and you, you, you know, you, you stalk them, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you feel like you just have a relationship with them. That's the way some of y'all do with God. You show up at church, you sing songs about him, you read the Bible, you know the stories and everything's just great. And you think, oh, but you know, the whole time, Jesus is like, man, here's my phone number. Man, here's, here's my email. Text me. Hey, listen, let's do Thanksgiving. Let's hang out this weekend. You know, let's go. Do, and you're, I man, see, Jesus wants a relationship. He doesn't want you just to experience him on a Sunday morning. He doesn't want you just to get goosebumps. Do you hear me? He wants you to have a relationship with him. What are you going to do? What are you going to do in 2021 to be with him? Let me tell you, I'm working on being with my wife. One of my Christmas presents to her was this little, this little heart thing that she hangs in her prayer room that I can put love notes to her and, and I can tell her how much I love her and I can spend time with her and I can work on, even after being married 36 years, I want to work on that relationship. I want to be with her. I mean, what are we doing to be with Jesus, to be with God? He, he left heaven to be with you. He, he died on a cross to be with you. He suffered and bled to be with you. How much is it going to cost you? Some time? Some, a little bit of sacrifice? Giving up a movie? Some Netflix series? I mean, what's it going to be, people, to spend some time and really have a relationship with God the way he wants to have with you? Here's the last thing to think about. If God is with you, 
How will your life be different? John, and I want to say John Stott, who's a theologian, he wrote these things. He said, anyone that ever met Jesus did three things. One, they were either terrified and they ran away. Two, they hated him and they wanted to kill him and stone him. Or three, they bowed down and worshiped him. I hope that in 2021, we are a people who bow down and worship at the knees and the feet, on our knees, but the feet of Jesus. I hope in 2021, because God is with you, that you are not ashamed of this incredible truth of the incarnation and the gospel. Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God that's revealed from faith to faith that is written, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He even tells us in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, to go and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything. And then he says, and lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. The truth is we can just shout about his love. We can yell at people and tell them, hey, God loves you. Or we can demonstrate it. At the fellowship, we talk a lot about being the hands and feet of Christ. We talk about loving our community. We talk about real tangible ways to serve. That we talk about that the gospel is both integral. It's an integral gospel. It's demonstration and proclamation. It's word and deed. And so this year, we respond in a way that shows, that both shouts of God's love, but shows his love as well on earth. He is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God with. Jesus is God with us. I love this quote by Tim Keller. He said, some people have died with those words on their lips like John Wesley. But he said, I propose that we live with those words upon our hearts. God with us. It's the best, isn't it? It's the best. Father God, we thank you that you are with us. And even now, Lord, we just confess that you are everything. You are enough. As we go into 2021, Lord, we just acknowledge that your power, your presence with us is enough. Christ is enough. Lord, we don't need what the world says we need. We don't need uh, all of the, the possessions. We don't need all of the wealth. Lord, we don't need to be happy, God. We don't need all the stuff the world says that defines us and makes us. Lord, we have you. And Lord, our prayer is that God, that would be a truth and a reality. Lord, right now, if there are those who are listening and are saying, you know, I want that, Jerry. I want God to be with me. I want to be with God this year. Then I just invite you right now to pray a simple prayer. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I believe in you. Thank you for loving me so much that you would leave heaven, come to earth, live this perfect life, and die for me. And I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection. Oh God, come into my life that I may be those that you are with, God with us. We love you. We thank you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and sing the song, Christ is Enough.
2021 by giving your life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. Here's a slide that's up on the screen. We'd love for you to simply text this number. And you can write anything in there. You say, you know, I'm following Jesus or Christ is enough or saved with an exclamation point. Whatever you want to tell us, we would love to celebrate with you. And we would love to go into 2021 journeying with you and helping you to come to know and to be with Christ in the coming year and just helping you and disciple you in that and help you to learn the ways of Jesus and how to follow Jesus. So if you just would let us know, that would be an awesome, awesome thing. Hey, this is the last Sunday of 2021. 
New Year's is coming up this week. One of the things we do is we pray through the new year. When you leave here, you'll find some uh, kiosk out here and Jane Gehring, who heads up our prayer team, she's out there. Just take an, sign up for an hour, pick an hour and you get a prayer guide and all you do is pray through the prayer guide. And it's just a great time to be alone with God and, and just pray, listen to him and pray. And I hope that you'll do that. You also can go on and download the prayer guide. It will be on our website as well. And, uh, but you can sign up. We hope to fill 24 hours uh, with slots. And I hope that you'll go and do that. Hey, listen, next week, Pastor Brian is going to be here and give the first message of 2021. Now, we're still going to have one service next Sunday, 915. So just like today. And so you want to be there. What a great way to start the new year by gathering together. So I hope if you can, you'll be here. Then in two weeks, on the 10th, we will start two services, 9 o'clock and 1045, restaurant style at 9, masks required the whole time during the 1045. Let me tell you, I have talked to so many people who can't wait for the 1045 because they have longed to come back. They miss the church. They were out there Christmas Eve with us. And I saw them and they said, oh, I can't wait to be back. And I'm so excited that we are doing this, a masked required and a masked restaurant style. So God bless you. Have an awesome new year. And we'll see you in 2021.